Good morning. Hey, go ahead if you would and stand to your feet for me. Just want to take a moment to greet you and just say we're glad you're here. I want to welcome you if you're joining us online. A special welcome to you as well. Today may be a day you need to refresh that hot cup of coffee or some hot chocolate. Maybe you need to grab a, a donut or a bagel and just bring it in here today. And we just ask that you worship God today and experience Him. Our prayers that you experience Him in the way that you need to experience Him uh, today. If you uh, are visiting with us, we'd love to know you're here when you came in and you received hopefully a little handout. And inside that handout is the connection card. Just take a moment to fill that out for us. And on your way out the door, there's a little wood box in our giving center. There's a basket over in the, our guest services area. And just drop that in there on your way uh, out the door. Uh, we're, uh, we're continuing our series today, the Son of God series. We had a powerful time this morning. And just expect the same thing uh, this, after, this afternoon, or this service, the second service here. This afternoon, whatever it is. Um, glad you're here. <laughs> take a moment and greet somebody.
God, as we sing this song to you from our, the depths of our hearts, Lord, in this moment, may we praise you and glorify you as you deserve.
sing these words to you from our hearts, Lord. We honor your name this morning with our voices, with our pose. We honor you. God, speak to us this morning from your word. Speak clarity to us, God. We might leave here changed in some way, God. It's in your great name. Amen. Please watch the screens with us. Your son is the promised king of his people. What is his name? His name is Jesus. Jesus will now read from my eye. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. 
which you used to pull. He has sent me to declare freedom for the captives and recovery of sight for the blind, to set free those who are oppressed. Today, this scripture is fulfilled. That, uh, fil- that, that clip is from the film The Son of God, and, uh, and uh, if you haven't had a chance to, to watch that film, I encourage you to do that. I don't get any royalties from that, but went out yesterday, saw it, and was pretty impressed by, by what I saw. It's really hard to get the life of Jesus um, compiled into a movie He's about two and a half hours long, but I think they did a, a pretty good job overall. But we're in our third week of a four-week series that coincides with this film because We just believe that there was such a a, a national uh, opportunity there with the showing of this film to kind of be able to preach about some certain qualities that the film bring out about who Jesus is. And in this clip you just saw was out of Luke chapter 4, and and early on in Jesus' ministry, he makes the decision to go back to his hometown of Nazareth. And it says that he walked into a synagogue, and just as you saw in the on the video clip, he begins to proclaim out of the book of Isaiah that he was the fulfillment of a certain prophecy in Isaiah 61. And if you read back to the Luke's account of this of this scene, it says that Jesus purposely took the scroll of Isaiah 61. Because he was going to show right then and there, or share right then and there, who he really was. For Jesus, he knew who he was. And he was about to reveal to his hometown that he was the Messiah that they had all been waiting for. Mark's take on this account is a little different than Luke's. He brings out the fact that the people there had a um, had a lot of questions in regarding who Jesus was. And Chip, I'm getting some feedback up here. Thank you, sir. And one of the questions they they, they raised during during this moment was this: Is this is this the carpenter? The son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, isn't the sisters here with us? I mean, for them, they were perplexed because of what they heard. Surely there was a lot of consternation around the fact that he just proclaimed himself to be the Messiah. But all they remember him was this this little boy that became a carpenter and and went off into the great big world around them and began to uh, preach this great new teaching that they had never heard before. It was him who became so famous that thousands of people had gathered him around him. And now this great uh, superstar, uh, per se, was coming back and he was telling them that he was the Messiah. Well, this wasn't the first time and only time in the Gospels that there would be questions regarding who Jesus was. Throughout the entire Gospel account, people always wondered, who is this man really to be? In fact, we... We see a lot of times the Pharisees ask these questions. For example, they ask him, Who is this man that can forgive people of their sins? Who is this man that can heal on the Sabbath? 
Who is this man who, who calls himself a rabbi, but yet is also a friend of sinners? Even his disciples had, had questions regarding who he was. Remember that time when they're out in the, in the boat in the middle of the lake and, and they're being tossed about by the, uh, by the storm and, and Jesus appears to them walking on the water and, they, and what was their exclamation? Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? The Pharisees had questions. The chief priests had questions. That at Jesus' trial, he comes up to Jesus and says, Are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? Even the thief on the cross asked him, Are you not the Christ? John the Baptist, who at his very baptism of Jesus, knew who he was, proclaimed that he believed that Jesus was the Messiah, also had doubts in his lifetime. Remember what he did? He, he sent two of his disciples to ask Jesus, one question, and here was the one question. Are you the expected one, or should we be looking for someone else? Well, in Luke chapter 9, and that's our text this morning, and I invite you to turn there with me, Luke chapter 9, and we're going to be looking at verse 18. And as you're going to Luke chapter 9, either in your copy of God's Word or, or if you have an electronic copy, um, as you're getting there, let me just kind of give you a background to what, what's taking place. By this time, Jesus' ministry has, has grown pretty large, probably a year, year and a half into his ministry. People everywhere he would go, by the thousands, would flock to, to see him heal, uh, heal people and, and see the miracles that were there. Um, they were also gathered around to hear this great teaching. Like I said before, this teaching that Jesus had was something that they had never heard in their lifetime. In fact, they, they proclaimed that there had not been a prophet like Jesus that had arisen in many, many years. And so he was the, the, you know, the, the, the end thing of that moment. And so people were coming around him. And, and he just got done doing one of the greatest miracles that he did. That was the, the feeding of the 5,000 with, what, two fish and five loaves of bread. And the crowd at that time were pressing in on him, wanting to proclaim him as their king. But Jesus knew that his time was not right. And so he slips away from the crowd and he, he finds this, this quiet and, and, and lonely place and, and with his disciples around him only. Let me just say this. It, the scene opens up and it says that while Jesus was praying, and any time in Scripture that you read that, that Jesus is praying or he just gets done with a season of prayer, something is bound to happen, and it does so in this passage. Because even though a lot of people had questions about Jesus, Jesus had the question about himself. And so let's read what he says, where he asks. It says, And it happened that while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he questioned them, saying, Who do people say I am? They answered and said, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. But others, that one of the prophets of old has risen again. And he said to them, But who do you say I am? And Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. But he warned them and instructed them not to tell this to anyone, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to, uh, to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? If you didn't know any better, you would think that Jesus had a, had a moment of doubt himself and maybe an identity crisis about who he really is. And, but, but that wasn't what was going, going on here. Jesus had a purpose of asking the question. And the Bible says what they answer. I mean, I, when, I, when I picture this scene in my mind, I, I picture it this way. Jesus is standing there, and, they're, and they're maybe they're just get done eating dinner, and they're just, you know, taking, talking, you know, just some uh, small talk, and Jesus just asks a question. So, by the way, who do, you, who do you think people think I am? And I believe that they just, you know, just talked over, one, talked over each other trying to give him the answer. I mean, the things that they said about Jesus, I mean, it was, it was incredible. I mean, they were saying some good things. They were complimenting Jesus. 
They were saying, you know, well, some people believe that uh, you're John the Baptist who was, who was raised from the dead. Or, oh my goodness, Jesus, I heard someone say that you had to be the second coming of Elijah. Matthew's account of this, of this passage says that either, either said that he was the prophet Jeremiah coming back to life. And so, and so they had a lot of things to say. And Jesus was taking it all in. And, and you've got to wonder, why did Jesus say, why do people say about me? It's as if he didn't know what people said about him. He had heard, he had heard the, uh, the name calling. He had, he had known what people's opinions were. He didn't need his disciples to tell him that. But he did that to set his disciples up. Because that wasn't the question that was on his heart. The, the question that was on his heart was this. Who do you say I am? Now, it's one thing to be asked in an in, 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 in impersonal question, right? But when it comes down to a personal question, you don't see in this text that they're just clamoring all over one another to tell Jesus the answer. It's kind of like there, there had to be this this, this big old long pause after that question. You know, like kind of like when you're in a, in a meeting at work and the boss asks a question or the boss asks for, for new ideas and, and by golly, you don't want to be called out so you kind of doodle you know, on your piece of paper in front of you. You make no eye contact with your boss because you know the moment that you make eye contact with your boss, they're going to ask you, you know, to answer the hard question or to come up with these great ideas. And I kind of wonder if that's what was going on in this scene. Disciples kind of kicking the dirt, you know, looking at their feet, not really wanting to address, you know, that question. Because that was a loaded question. It was personal. I mean, you've been with me for a year and a half. You've seen my miracles. You've been, you've been with me on, on, in the front row at my teaching time. You, you have seen me bring the dead back to life. I mean, you've been with me in the in, in intimate moments as well as in my public ministry. If there was anyone that knew who Jesus was at that time, it wasn't the crowds, but it had to be these 12 men. And so after that pause that went on, good old Peter, boy, we love Peter, don't we? Peter just shouts out, you are the Christ of God. And what was Jesus' response? It was almost like winner, winner, chicken dinner. You got that right. You got it. You nailed that one on the bullseye, Peter. Matthew says that, Matthew's account says, only God could have revealed that to you, Peter. You see, it's one thing like for Peter to go on the ledge and stake his very life on that claim. The Christ of God. The Christ. That's a, that's a strange uh, comment to make. You know, we often, we often hear the term Jesus Christ. We believe that, some people believe that's his, his name, but that wasn't really his name. It wasn't a surname. Christ is not a surname. It's a title given to Jesus. Peter was basically saying, Jesus, you are the Messiah sent from God. You are the Messiah that we have been waiting for since Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. The title Christ is just the, the English transliteration of the Greek word Christos, which is the Greek uh, transliteration of the, uh, the Hebrew word for Messiah or for the anointed one. And so what, what Peter was saying was, Jesus, you are the, the anointed one of God, whom God has sent to his people to redeem them. You are the one that was promised to us ages ago. And now you are here. You are our Messiah. And just like that question during Jesus' day was such a polarizing question, you know, it's a polarizing question even today. Who do you say? Jesus is. I believe if you went off, went out to, to Walmart today, or, or or if you go out to eat at a restaurant and you ask people that were waiting in line with you, you know. So tell me, who do you say Jesus is? I guarantee you, you're going to hear a plethora of comments. There's a lot of people with a lot of different opinions about who Jesus is. But the only opinion that really matters is what does the Bible claim that Jesus is, and who did Jesus say that he is? But it's also important to us who are followers of Jesus Christ to know the answer to that question. Because what you believe Jesus is makes the world a difference. Who you think he is makes the world 
of difference. Who you acknowledge him to be, not only in your life, but in, in this life yet to come, says everything in the world about who your life is banked on. C.S. Lewis, who was a 20th century um, philosopher, I would say a Christian apologist, um, in his book, Mere Christianity, puts it this way, and it's a long quote, so I, I, I took the liberty of, of, of printing it out on the screen so you can follow along with me, but it's powerful what he says about Jesus. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing you, we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil, devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or some worse. You can't shut him up for a fool. You can't spit at him. You can kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with the, any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that door open to us. He did not intend to. You see, this is the confession. That the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one of God, that is at the very heart of Christianity. To own Jesus as, as the Christ is at the very heart of what we believe as Christ followers. And that is why Jesus is zeroing in on this question. Because he knew a lot of people had a lot of things to say about him, and they just simply were not the, not the truth. And sometimes we as his followers, maybe we also have this ambiguity about Jesus, trying to make him into something that he never claimed to be. Like I said, a lot of people have different thoughts about Jesus. Some say that Jesus was just a, a great moral teacher who was an incredible teacher of truth. And you know what? I mean, he was an amazing teacher, the greatest teacher that has ever graced the face of the earth. Yes, that's true. But is that all? Man, some would say he was a, a, a man of love, and he, he was not only did he love people, but he taught us how to love. True. But is that all? Others might say, well, he was a, a great man of justice and he always spoke truth to power. And I love it when, when people speak truth to power. True. Is that, is that all? I mean, is there anything that we could claim as followers of Christ that would set him apart from all others? Well, to say that he is the Christ, the Messiah, my Messiah. My Savior, my Lord, your Savior, your Lord. That's what separates him from all other things. Because you are surrounded by a lot of worldviews about what you ought to believe about Jesus. But does what you say about him reflect a biblical foundation of who he really was? You know, let me put it, the, put it to you this way. If you were to ask me a question, this question, who is the greatest basketball player to have ever lived? My response to you, hands down, without even giving it a second thought, is this man, the Chicago Bull himself, Michael Jordan, right? There is no one greater than him. Now, some people would say, in fact, they just did a poll, the NBA did a poll about the legends of basketball, and some would say that they're neck and neck with Kobe Bryant. Well, Kobe's great, but he's not that guy, right? I mean, can Kobe do this? Can you show that second picture of him in the basketball? Can Kobe do this? I don't know if you can. That, only one man can do that. That's an iconic picture right there. And even though Kobe was a, was a, was a, was a great uh, basketball player, he's no Michael Jordan. Uh, Pete Maravich, boy, he was a great basketball player in his day. No Michael, not a Michael Jordan. Uh, Wilt Chamberlain, phenomenal. But just not Michael Jordan. And if, and if I was just so lucky to come up to Michael Jordan in the flesh and I happened to see him, you know, out in public and I said, hey, are you Michael Jordan? He said, yeah. And if I said, hey, are you the guy who used to play minor league baseball? Remember that? Remember that? He tried to do the, do the minor league thing with the Birmingham Barons, right? 
I think it was even so brief that he didn't even know, that, know about it, right? But if I came to him and said, man, I identify you as a baseball player, yeah, it was, it's true, but that's not who Michael Jordan really is. If I came up to him and said, you know what, Michael Jordan, you are the Reggie Miller of your day. Now, Reggie Miller was a great basketball player, but he was no Michael Jordan. He might have been a great analyst of the game, not Michael Jordan, because Michael Jordan was the greatest basketball player of all time. Same thing about Jesus. Yes, he was a, a man of love. Yes, he was a man of compassion. Yes, yes, he, he loved sinners. Yes, yes, he healed people, but there was much, much more to him than those things. Jesus declared what was the most important, that we know that he is the Son of God, that he was the fulfillment of all prophecies made about him in the Old Testament. It's not enough to say that he was a good moral teacher or a, a man of peace or justice or, or just another path of many paths out there that we can go to God and, and find our way into heaven. C.S. Lewis was right about it. I mean, I mean, we cannot patronize this question anymore in our lives. Jesus did not leave open the door for us to say, that, to say, we define who you are. No, Jesus says, I have defined myself, and it is up to you whether or not to believe in what I said I am to be. He clearly proclaimed himself to be the Messiah. There was no ambiguity about it, was there? When you read the gospel accounts, he comes out and says that, that he is the one from on high. He is the son of man. Wasn't he the one who came out and said, I am the bread of life. I am the great shepherd. I am the door to the sheep. I am the living water. I am the resurrection and the life. I am life itself. I am the word of God. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father but by me. I don't know how else to explain it, but I don't see any ambiguity. I don't see any grayness there. I don't see any fuzzy line there with who Jesus proclaimed himself to be. It's only when we do not want to accept him to be the only way and the only truth and the only life is where we get into some trouble. And that's what the world says about our Savior. So Jesus asks us to make a markation in our very life and say, who do you say I am? In your, in your heart right now, in your, in your mind right now, who is it to you? Do you truly have an understanding of who Christ says that he is. Well, Jesus wants us to make that declaration, to say, I know who Jesus is. And it's one thing to say, I know who Jesus is, but it's another thing to, to, to go out in the real world and say, not only do I know who Jesus is, but I will stake my life on him. It's one thing for, for Peter to, to stand up in front of Jesus himself, the Messiah himself, and, and with the other disciples and say, all right, this is a pretty safe place here to, to make this comment. You are the Christ, but it's a different thing to, to go out in his, for the rest of his life and give his life and sacrifice his life for the sake of this man being the Messiah. And Jesus asks the same thing for us. No only does he ask us to, 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 to say it with our lips, but he also demands that we back it up with the very obedience of our life. And so the question in Luke chapter 9 was, who do I say I am? But there's also an underlining question, too, that, that Jesus uh, brings up to his disciples in, in, the, in the text to follow in that question. So, so Peter makes the proclamation, yes, you are the Christ. And, and so Jesus says, okay, okay, I got it, got it. Wow, wonderful idea there. I'm glad you finally understand who I am, Peter. But listen, what he, what he does in verse 23, he's not speaking to Peter alone. Look what he says, he says, and he was saying to them all. So look what he says to them all. Because what he says to his disciples, he also says to you and I who claim to be his followers as well. Look what he says in, verse, in verses 23 and following. If anyone wishes to come after me, if anyone wishes to say that I am the anointed one, that I am the Messiah, well, he must deny himself, one. 
And two, he must take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. So here's the second underlying question there is this. Will you pick up your cross and follow Christ? Will you pick up your cross and follow Christ? Will you, will, will your public affirmation of your life be the same as your private declaration? Because if you're a follower of Christ, you've, you've made at some point a decora- de- declaration, I believe that you are truly the Son of God, and I believe in you, and I surrender my life to you, and I invite you to be my Lord and Savior, and now Jesus says, that's fine and w- wonderful. And he wants that for all of us. But he also wants us to declare with our very lives, our very obedience, that we are followers of him by denying ourselves and picking up our cross and following hard after him. Every Good Friday in the, in the northern city of San Juan, Philippines, a large crowd will gather in the middle of town. And a group of men will come out and they will have made some uh, makeshift crosses and they will carry these crosses on their back and, and, they will, and the, the crowd will follow them outside of town. And outside of San Juan's uh, uh, township, there's this large hill. And on top of this large hill, men will literally reenact the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Now, these are not, these are not fake actors. They're, they're going, going through with the real thing. They are literally nailing themselves to the cross. Now, why do they do that? Well, this is why they do that, because some of them do it because they want good luck. They need good luck for the coming year. They do it out of penance. The Huffington Report, a report uh, went there last year, and, and they interviewed one of the men. His name was Reuben Anahe, who in, 20, in 2013 was his 27th time crucifying himself to the cross. And so when they asked Reuben, why does he do this year after year? This was Reuben's response. He says, I do this so that my sins may be forgiven from the past year. Reuben and all these other men and those who participate in these reenactments of of the crucifixion, they don't understand the very grace of God. They themselves do not need to put themselves on a cross for 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 the Messiah himself died on the cross once and for all, for the payment of sin. We are already in his good graces because of the blood of Christ. He already loves us because of the blood of Christ. No need to take the penalty of sin upon ourselves. The penalty of sin was put upon the Lamb of God himself while he was on the cross. But Jesus says to us, that's already been done for you. What I need for you to do is just do these two things. Just deny yourself. Why would Jesus ask us to deny ourselves in order to follow him? Because when we deny ourselves, when we we put ourselves last, this is what we're saying. The life that we live is not about me. It's not about my kingdom. It's not about my glory. It's not about my wants and my wishes and what makes me happy. No, my citizenship is not on earth. It's in heaven and, and I belong to a king and not to myself. I belong to a, 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 a heavenly kingdom and not an earthly kingdom. To deny ourselves in a, in a world that basically tells us that, we, hey, we're A number one. Everything's about you. You know, the planets circle you, right? You know, it's about how you want to live your life. It's about, you know, what, however you want to act, you can go ahead and act. Whoever you want to be, you can go ahead and be. But Jesus says, if you are a follower of me, you can't do that. This past Friday, I was at the post office, and this kind of came to light about denying, denying oneself. I was standing in line. I'm not sure if you guys have this same um, situation I find myself in for the past, you know, eight years I've lived in Springfield. But for some reason, they have like six counters open at the main post office, but they only have two people working it. I don't know if you guys have ever been there when that's ever happened, but it always happens to me. Always in a long line at the post office. Friday afternoon's not a good time to go to the post office, I guess, because I was probably like 14th or 15th in line. Line stre- stretch all the way to the back door. Well, in comes this older gentleman, and you know what he does? He basically walks around the entire line, goes around the little bin there, goes up to a clerk who's happening who's happened to, to be working with another customer at the time, butts in on the conversation, takes over that space, and basically said, here's what, here's what my needs are. I need a book of stamps, 
and I need to pick up some tax forms, and I need to drop off this letter. And she's like, sir, you know, that's fine, wonderful, but you know what? You need to go back to the back line. The guy wasn't having it. I mean, it was his opportunity at the moment, and he, didn't need, he had a need, and a need to be taken care of right then and there. Exasperated, she just gives up on the guy and, and basically shoots the customer aside and basically helps him. Now, there's a lot of grumbling and complaining going on, and I'm sure I was one of them, you know, but I didn't do it too loud. But that's the way our world is. It's about us, about me. And listen, I'm no different from that guy. Now, I may not have the nerve to, to walk past 15 people in a line, you know, right? But there are times when I'm driving down Glenstone, I wish that that road was just made for Dave Myers alone, right? I mean, there are times in our lives that we wish that we were the center of attention and all things were about us and, and meeting our needs and making us happy. And, and I'm just as guilty. But Jesus says, David, and for all of us who want to be a follower of him, you can't live your life that way. Because when you live that wa- your life in a very selfish manner, you're missing out on why I died for you. So Jesus says, I call you as a follower of mine to give up your rights. And that doesn't settle well with us, right? Because we live in the great old U.S. of A. and everyone has rights. But when you are part of a heavenly kingdom, your rights are a lot different. And we deny ourselves and we submit ourselves to the very will of our Heavenly Father so that His glory and His will will be teared out in our lives and not our own. And when you deny yourself, that's when you begin to say, I can pick up this cross. I know if we have that other, other picture or not, Cliff, but sometimes around Easter time, you'll see this, you know, you'll see a scene of somebody carrying a cross down the street and, the, and it always has a little wheel on it, right? Makes it a lot easier. But what Jesus was saying was not to pick up a physical cross, right? He was talking about picking up whatever those things in your life that causes you pain, that causes you hurt, those things in your life that have, that have caused disappointment, those, those things in your life that you have to shoulder as you make your way through this earthly experience of ours. And sometimes, and you guys already know it, just like I know it, life is painful and tough and disappointing. I mean, you're always, there's, there's never a week that's going to go by that you're not going to receive some sort of news that's going to crush your spirit or, or hurt you in some way. I mean, relationships are hard to deal with, and, and that comes with baggage. Just, you know, our sin that we have in our life, that brings baggage. There's a lot of things that, that wear us down. And Jesus is saying, you know what, in order for you to follow me, you're going to have to pick up that cross. Because if you don't pick up that cross, you're going to end up dragging your cross. And when you drag your cross, it's going to weigh you down. And you're not going to be, and you're going to want to give up and from trusting and following me. He says, pick it up, shoulder it. And there are things that God will not take out of our lives. And those things that God will not take out of our lives, those, those prayers that we, we cry out to God that he would answer, and he does not answer them, you know what? that he expects us to pick them up and shoulder them and still pursue him with a white, hot, passionate pursuit. So it's just not about saying, Jesus, yep, you're the one. It's being able to say, in my pain, (laughs) in my suffering, in my groanings, both day and night, with, with, the, with the wants of my life going unmet, he's still Jesus. He's still the Son of God. He's still my Messiah. He's still my Redeemer. He's still my hope. That's what it's about. And so when Jesus asked the question, it was important for his disciples to answer, but it's also important for us to answer And if you can say today that, yes, Jesus is the Son of God, the second question is, can you demonstrate that? Jesus is not saying that we should just, you know, know, tap dance through life and put on 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 a fake happy face. What he's saying is that we treasure him in the midst of our loss. We treasure him in the midst of our hurt. We treasure him in the midst of life's questions. Right? And that's where the rubber meets the road. 
when we can say with our lips, he is the Christ, and we can say through our pain, oh, he is the Christ. This morning, can you answer that question, who Jesus is? Has anyone ever asked you to, to make that claim in your life? Maybe you're online visiting us with us this morning and, and you've never made that, that proclamation in your life. It all starts there, folks. It all starts there. Where, we, where, we, where Jesus doesn't force his way into our life, we have to, what, invite him in? We have to surrender who we are in order for him to be the very Lord of, li- of our life. And it comes down to, I believe, Jesus, that you are the Son of God. I believe that, that God loved, so loved the world that he gave the God his only begotten son. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would never perish but have eternal life. I believe in that. And the Bible says all you have to do is believe. Believe in your heart. And also confess with your mouth that he is the son of God and you shall be saved. Wonderful, wonderful. It's that easy. But are you truly willing to make him known in your life through the denying of yourself and following him. If you are here this morning, you've never made that commitment, and you're saying, boy, I don't know if I can follow him. I don't know if I can, I can, if I can because if I, if I want him to be my Lord and Savior, he's going to have to take care of everything in my life. And then the answer is you're going to be highly disappointed. Yes, he will be a, a friend to you. And yes, he will be with you at all times, in all ways, in all seasons of life. Yes, he will be faithful when we are faithless ill. But sometimes, sometimes you've got to pick up your cross and follow him. And let me tell you, let me tell you this. After 30 plus years in my own life, he is worth it all and much, much more. And even if I lost it all, he is still worth it all. I love what... Uh, what Jesus tells Peter in John chapter 21. Remember, Jesus says to him at the very end, he says, Peter, you know, when you were younger, you used to do whatever you wanted to do. But when you grow older, someone's going to take you by the hand and lead you down the path you don't want to go. That's the same thing with us. When we trust in him to be our Lord and Savior, and when we pick up our cross and deny ourselves and follow after him, sometimes that road that he takes us down is not the most smoothest and pain-free road. It comes with a lot of twists and turns. It will be faithful all the way. For Jesus is who he says he is. And as C.S. Lewis said, either he is a, a lunatic or the devil himself. He has made no ambiguity who he is. He is the son of the living God. Your only hope, my only hope, the world's only hope, the only Savior who can save you from your sins. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for um, revealing yourself through your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, that, that you are the God who has redeemed mankind from his sins. You are the God who has brought hope into a hopeless world. You are the God who's shine light in the midst of darkness. You are the one who has said, I will carry the burden of mankind's sin upon myself. And Father, we thank you that, Lord, that you provided the way of salvation and the way of hope and the way of life through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, today we stand and confess to you as followers of Christ that, yes, we, like Peter, say that you are the Christ of God, and there is no other that I place my trust in. There is no other that I pledge my allegiance to. There is no other that I, outside of Christ, who I give my life to. And this morning, Lord, I pray that you will just move within this room. For those who, who may be here this morning or watching via the internet, that but Father, that they've never made a commitment to you. Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, would you work in the lives of men and women? As they confess to you, Lord, I need you as my Savior. Would you just breathe that new life in them? 
Father, we pray that, Lord, that you would be most glorified in this time of invitation, this time of reflection, as we join, Lord, with this worship team, this anthem. May this anthem be the anthem of our heart. For it is in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I want to invite you to stand and, and join the worship team as they sing this last song. Pastor Mike's over here to my left, your right. Pastor John's over this way. I'm here. We would love to minister to you in any way. Maybe today you want to give your life to Christ. Uh, if you're online, uh, you, can, you can also voice out your need too, and people will be there to pray with you as well. Um, you, any other ministry we can minister to you, Lord, minister to you today, just seek us out. We would love to do that. Join with the worship team with this song.
Amen. Man, I don't know about you, but I, for one, am so glad that he was not just a great teacher, that he was not just a great man, that he was not just a, a good friend, but yet that he was the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the Son of God. Thank you, Dave, for that. Thank you for the reminder of that. And, and uh, just to put your guys' minds at ease, Pastor Dave did not go postal at the post office, and we did not have to bail him out of jail. Uh, he went, oh, he was okay. So a couple of things I want to let you know about before you head out of here is um, next week we'll be having a Discovery Northbridge luncheon. Uh, and that basically is for those of you who have been visiting with us and kind of want to know a little bit more about who we are. Uh, we ask that you come to one of those luncheons, and, and uh, we will provide you lunch. Um, we just need to know you're going to be there. Sign up for that on your connection card. You can drop that again in the uh, giving uh, center or in the guest services area, and that way we know that you're going to be there. Also, a couple of things about Easter coming up. Um, this year we're going to be doing a community Easter egg hunt. Um, that will be the Saturday before Easter. It will be from 2 to 3.30. Uh, we'll be getting some more information to you about that, but basically what you need to know at this point is we need workers. So you can sign up for that on your connection card. There's a sign-up sheet for that over there in the front table. And we also need candy to fill the eggs with. So be bringing uh, some candy, and you can put that again on that table over there. Um, that is for anyone with kids. If you have family and friends or you know people you want to invite to that, it would be a great uh, thing to invite them to. And then the following uh, day, Sunday, is Easter Sunday, and we'll be doing a baptism service here at the church. And so if that's something that you would be interested in or want to know a little bit more about or maybe have never experienced that, please connect with me or Pastor Mike, Pastor Tony, or Pastor Dave, and we'd love to talk to you more uh, about that as well and get you uh, connected and signed up for that. So I think that's it. I hope you have had a great morning. I hope you have been blessed. I hope you heard today what you needed to hear. Uh, be careful on your way home. God bless you. You are dismissed.